Hello everyone and welcome to another session of chemistry. Today we are talking about the greenhouse effect. Okay, so last time we didn't actually get an awful lot of new content covered in the session, but that was good because what we did is we established what everyone already knew. So that's actually saved us a lot of time going over the things that people already did and didn't know. So from the little Kahoot quiz that we did, and from Edmodo as well, it was pretty obvious that everyone had a pretty good understanding of the effects of global warming, the problems it causes, and most people were able to name a couple of greenhouse gases as well. What a few people struggled with is the link with physics. <laughs> and one or two of you actually said uh, in the comments that I was completely fine until the physics came up. <sighs> Such is life. Yes, this is a bit of an interesting issue because the greenhouse effect and the associated global warming is a kind of strange overlap within science itself. So there's bits of it that are applied to biology, there's bits of it that apply to chemistry, there's bits of it that apply to physics, but there's also bits that you might have talked about in geography as well. So let's work on establishing the uh, physics basis. And what we will do is we will build upon that to get it where we want for chemistry. So here's the title and learning objectives for these lessons. You are very welcome to pause the video now and write those down. And here's a little task for you to have a think of as well. What I want you to do, based on your knowledge from physics, is name all the electromagnetic waves that are found in the electromagnetic spectrum, sometimes called the EM spectrum for short. I'm just going to give you a moment to have a go at that now. So the electromagnetic spectrum, um, these letters here are the first letters of each of the EM waves that we find in the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, there are a number of different ways that you can choose to remember them. Uh, I believe it's called an acrostic where you can write words following those letters uh, to get a silly sentence uh, to help you remember it. Um, a few years ago, some year 11s came up with some very rude ways of remembering it. Um, which I don't really feel comfortable sharing with you right now, uh, but you're very welcome to try and make your own. What we're going to do first, though, is quickly look what they're supposed to be, and then you can make up your own silly acrostic to help you remember it, and feel free to share those in the comments. So the G stands for gamma. Gamma radiate. Gamma radiation, gamma waves. We're talking Bruce Banner, The Incredible Hulk. OK, X is for X-ray. U is for UV or ultra violet. V is for visible light, i.e. the normal sorts of colours that we see. So within that, we can talk about uh, Roy G. Biv, red, Richard of York gave battle in vain, red, orange. Yeah, the spectrum of the colours. I stands for IR, as in infrared, infra hyphen red. Um, people have different opinions on whether or not the hyphen needs to be there. Um, so far as I've ever found, um, there is no one consensus. There's no one everyone's agreed on. It has to be with a hyphen or without a hyphen. You do what you like. It's all good. So, uh, gamma, x-ray, ultraviolet, also called UV, visible light, which is also, you know, the colours, uh, infrared, sometimes called IR for short, uh, the M stands for micro, as in microwaves, as in the waves that we use in our food preparation device called a microwave, and then radio waves. wouldn't necessarily have to have waves after radio there I just included it because I like to so gamma x-ray uv visible light ir microwave and radio waves that is the electromagnetic spectrum now what I'm going to do is just give you a moment now if you want to come up with a silly way to remember that you are very welcome to you're very welcome to pause the video now to come up with a few of those. If you're watching this via webinar, I will, of course, pause the video now and share the best ones, uh, but probably not the rudest ones. You can keep those to yourselves. A 
Okay, so before we move on, what we're going to have a look at is labeling a wave. Now, this again, this is physics. Uh, I shouldn't have to do this, uh, but actually I am going to do this because this is actually going to help us with talking about the energy and how that interacts with the chemicals. So it helps us from a chemistry point of view. So a few things that we need to sort of label here are um, from here to here. So from the baseline to the top of that little wave, which is called the peak. So at the very top, it's called a peak and the line there, let's just call it a baseline for now. Does anyone know what that is called? That is called the amplitude. Uh, and when we get back to school, I'll tell you a silly way to remember that. We'll leave that there. Uh, now, I'm going to do some more annotations. And when I've done this before, people say it ends up looking a little bit rude. Um, it, it, I, I, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, you choose to see that as however you want to see that. This is where people tend to put little comments. So I like to sort of just highlight that area. The point from the tip of both of those peaks from there to there is called the wavelength. OK, and within a uh, one of these waveforms, what you might see is. Lots of waves together in which case that would have a small wavelength because the waves are close together. Which you can put wave L there for short because I'm running out of root, but a high frequency, so a high number of those waves in a small space. Okay, I'm just going to move that other diagram down a little bit because I didn't leave myself enough room there. Whereas if you've got a much larger wavelength, so there's a much larger distance between the peaks, that has got a large, I'm just going to go wave L again. Uh, there is a symbol for it. The symbol is lambda, kind of like a, an upside down backwards Y. Uh, that's got a large wavelength there, but a low frequency and it is low frequency because there's not a lot of waves there okay so some year 11s used to tell me that whenever they looked at these they thought they looked like boobies yeah um and their silly way of remembering the electromagnetic spectrum was to draw lots of these waves that they called boobies um, so gamma radiation or gamma uh, waves are very, very high frequency with a very small wavelength. Um, but what they said is gamma, the G stands for girls. And girls, if you see lots of girls, you'd see lots of like year 11s, I swear. So if we were looking at a gamma wave, we would see something like that with a very small wavelength. So small, and I will use the symbol lambda. It's got a high frequency and matched in with that is the energy that that wave possesses. So if it's got a small wavelength and a high frequency, that's gonna be very high energy. It's gonna have a lot of kinetic energy um, uh, and actually energy is linked um, to frequency in that equation not that that is particularly relevant to us right now but you can see there that uh, frequency which is that thing there is directly linked to energy so if it's high frequency it's going to be high energy as you go down the electromagnetic spectrum the wavelength gets larger and the frequency gets smaller. So visible light, for example, they're a little bit more spread out. So they've got a higher 
wavelength but there's less of them so there is a lower frequency so a slightly lower energy we don't think of a visible light as being that dangerous whereas gamma rays and x-rays we think of those as being pretty damn dangerous uh same with ultraviolet we know that ultraviolet is the things that burns your skin isn't it that's why we put sun cream in to protect from uva uvb ultraviolet light so the further we get down there the lower the frequency the higher the wavelength so the further away you get from girls the less you see I'm going to stop saying that because it's just it's just inappropriate but that's how those year 11s remembered it and it kind of worked so here we've got a high wavelength a low frequency therefore a low energy as well so the lower we go on this the lower the energy the two bits that we're going to be focusing on today are infrared and ultraviolet where the ultraviolet has a higher energy associated with it and uh, frequency and smaller wavelength whereas the infrared is of a lower energy now obviously within the magnetic electromagnetic spectrum there are things that have got higher and have got lower energy but compared to each other ultraviolet has got the higher energy and infrared has the lower energy Okay, so that's a bit of theory on waves recap there and the electromagnetic spectrum. How does this actually relate to the greenhouse effect? Well, it relates to the greenhouse effect because short ugly violet always really irritates Lucy in a temper tantrum. Miss, what's going on with you? You're saying strange words that don't make sense. Short, ugly violet always really irritates Lucy in a temper. So what on earth was I actually just on about? So this is just a silly way, just like with the electromagnetic spectrum, this is just a silly way to remember the key points that you need to cover when asked about the greenhouse effect in a chemistry paper. Short, ugly violet always really irritates Lucy in temper tantrums by choice, if you want to include that as well what this actually matches to. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what it matches to and then we're going to apply it to a diagram as well. So short does actually mean short. So short waves. So short waves travel towards the earth. They travel towards the earth in ugly violet. Can anyone guess what that one is? ultraviolet UV waves. So short waves, ultraviolet waves always matches to absorbs really stands for re-emitted Irritates, I'm going to use the I and the R there, that stands for infrared, which infrared is a long wavelength. Or certainly longer. In temper stands for increased temperature in temper it kind of sounds a bit similar there and the tantrums by choice is the increased temperature is trapped by choice the choice is just carbon dioxide c for carbon dioxide okay so that's kind of a, a silly way to remember it it might be helpful for you uh, you might want to think of another way to remember it just like we did for the other thing but this is the one that i've been using recently so short ugly violet always really irritates lucy in temper tantrums by choice short waves ultraviolet they absorbed then re-emitted infrared is a longer wave the increase of the temperature and is trapped by the co2 so what we're going to do now is we're going to try and apply that to a diagram i'm going to explain it a bit better as we go through as well 
Okay then, so here is our diagram. So we've got, uh, it's obviously not to scale. Uh, down here at the bottom right, you've got the earth. You, I have annotated on there sort of little dashed line, but it's not very, sh it's not showing up particularly well. So I'm just going over it now. So what we get in terms of the greenhouse effect is, first off, we get radiation coming from the sun. We discussed already that the main bit of radiation that's coming from the sun uh, is ultraviolet. So what we have got, now I've not done that at a particular wavelength or frequency there, I've just done that as a generic wiggly line. I could do it a bit more detail, so it's the correct wavelength and things like that, but let's just keep it simple for now. So what I've got going in here is the short waves, short, ugly, violet. I've got short waves, of UV radiation. So short waves of UV radiation go towards the Earth from the Sun. Now within our atmosphere uh, there are all sorts of different particles, we know that, we've talked about the composition of the atmosphere uh, and obviously there's the Earth itself. So some of that radiation, some of that energy from that radiation is absorbed. Hi Jin, this is Ginny. Get down Jin. Now that energy, yes, is partially absorbed, so you might want to put on your diagram a little sort of A or highlight it to show that some of that energy is being absorbed. So around here-ish, the energy is absorbed. Now it does not stay absorbed, it is then re-emitted. So you'd need to draw an arrow going back out from the earth. Now actually, in some cases, some of the energy uh, some of the wavelengths still have enough energy. So that energy is re-emitted. Now, some of it has enough energy to actually exit the, as exit the atmosphere, just like this one shown here. However, some of those waves are traveling too slowly to exit the atmosphere. So the waves that are re-emitted some of them do not have enough energy to get out of the atmosphere. So when they are, maybe are there for re-emitted, they are re-emitted as infrared radiation. So, so the irritates bit there, that's where that is. So it's re-emitted as infrared radiation, which is of a longer wavelength than it was previously because it's kind of slowed down a little bit and kind of stretched out okay so it is a longer wavelength so it gets kind of stuck in the atmosphere and it hits things like carbon dioxide and methane and there that infrared radiation when it hits that molecule is converted into the vibrations and the heat is trapped within our atmosphere So what else could we add to this diagram? Uh, you could ha have on IR there for infrared radiation. You could say that it's long -er wavelength. Uh, you could say that it's lower in energy, that the uh, short waves of UV are higher in energy. There's quite a few different ways that we can talk about this. But the answer format that the examiners have been looking for is the idea that it starts with short waves that are UV, that the Earth and the atmosphere absorbs some of this, but then re-emits, and that's something that lots of people left out on the exam last year, it re-emits it as infrared radiation. The infrared radiation is of a lower energy, but of a longer wavelength, so therefore it travels a little bit more slowly and therefore cannot get out of our atmosphere. It's not traveling quickly enough. So it remains trapped by, and you can name any of the greenhouse gases, but I'd probably go for carbon dioxide because that's most likely the one that they're going to be talking about. So as we've said before, the greenhouse effect is natural. If we didn't have the greenhouse effect, the earth would have been frozen millennia ago. In fact, we wouldn't be even be able to support life. So the greenhouse effect is not a problem. 
What is a problem is the fact that we are adding more greenhouse gases. So the natural effect that is good is now being exacerbated or made worse by our emissions. And this is leading to something called global warming. And global warming is what we're going to be talking about next time. So it's goodbye from me and my little helper, Ginny. Next time, global warming. <laughs>